How do I start my own business? Being my own brand would be totally legit. I want to be the next Gary V. My dream is to be on Shark Tank. I'm just gonna Google it. I mean, I'm awesome at social media. What could go wrong? Oh my God. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Learning Curves. Today, we're in episode 18, and I have Lori Penzikoski here with me today. And I'm so excited, Lori, to have you on my show. We are going to discuss a lot of really great topics today. We want to learn all about Lori and how she got into digital marketing. She's a digital marketing specialist. She does everything from Working, working on websites, SEO, Google AdWords. So her and I are going to have a lot to talk about. She's one of our experts here at CEA. And I think you're going to learn a lot from her today and a lot about from our conversation. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for having me, Kelly. Yeah, so Lori, um, let's start by telling me a little bit about yourself. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Lori Pensakoski. I'm a certified internet webmaster. And I was originally in the insurance field after college, and I owned an agency for a while, and then I became an agency manager for a large insurance company, but I was known as the weekend wife because I traveled throughout the state of Florida, and my husband and I actually wanted to have kids, and that's kind of hard when you're home maybe one to two nights a week. So I went ahead and I decided I wanted to retool. I went back to college, got another degree, got a couple certifications, and then I just started working in the digital space. And Kelly and I are now working together. And I specialize anything from web development, search engine optimization, local SEO, reputation management, um, Google Ads, Google My Business. And basically the whole thing is, is trying to put everything together. So that way they get 100% for their business in the digital on the in the digital space. And I can attest she does a really great job. <laughs> yeah, so um, I love I love your story. Um, you know, when I first met you, you don't, you don't find a lot of people that come from, you know, one industry like that and come over into the agency digital digital world. That's, a, that's an interesting um, change that happened to you um, after traveling. I think a lot of people that when they're going sometime through their mid-career or even, you know, like they said, either you're getting ready to start a family or I know a lot of my friends right now, a lot of us in our 50s and our kids are great, you know, in college getting ready to fly out of the nest and now we, you know, okay, now what about me? What am I going to do? So there a lot of people are, you know, thinking about what my second career is going to be. So tell me a little bit about that transition of going from one to the other. It was it was an interesting transition. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to transition out, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And so you're talking, this was 25 years ago, and insurance was, I want to say, um, the, the internet was like the hot topic. And I knew about computers, didn't know much about them, but knew I wanted to learn. At first, I wanted to actually become a programmer. Mm -hmm. And I went back and I started programming. I liked that. But I was like, you know, this gets kind of boring. So Is that what you went to school for? Um, went back to school for? I went back to school and got a programming okay. degree. And then I decided I wanted to actually do more than that. And I, I loved the web. So I went ahead and started taking web classes and learned um, web programming languages as well. Like at the time, like PHP, Yep. JavaScript at that time, Cold Fusion was big, and um, there was a lot of different things that, you that needed net. to know back then because there was all different kinds of programming languages. There was, yeah. there was, and so and then with web development, I I love the front end too. So I was learning, I was learning how to do the graphics and how to do everything else. So that's why, quote unquote, I got the certification, certified internet webmaster, mm -hmm. and I'm certified in programming and on the front end, and and um. And I started with the security as well. And then I had noticed, too, that a lot of people were asking about SEO as well and Google Ads. So I kind of became self-taught on that end. And there's a couple gurus in the industry. Um, and I put a formula together about 20 years ago on how to do SEO for certain things. And it still works today, even though things 
are constantly changing and there's constant updates with Google and, and different things, overall, the base formula still works. For SEO, that's interesting because I, um, tell us a little bit about that because I know, it's like, what are some of the major changes that you've seen in SEO and what are the, what are some of the things that you can st- still are the same as they were before? Oh, some of the major changes, well, 20, 20 years ago, you didn't, you really didn't have mobile devices. No. So <laughs> that was, a, that was a big thing for someone is in, at first people would have, they'd actually build a separate website for mobile. Yep. So you'd we have, to, that here. so <laughs> you'd have to do SEO for yes. both. Mm-hmm. So, and even if you attached one to the other, both would still need to, to have an SEO component to it. And another thing that's been big since then has been speed. Yes. And so it's trying to have the balance with having, you know, a professional looking website as long, um, along with speed. And now what a lot of people are doing is if they're finding that their website is slow, they're turning to AMP pages. But with AMP pages, that is, that's accelerated mobile pages. That is like building an entirely different mobile website because each page has to be built ha- has to be built on its own. But if you ever see a lightning bolt in front of a search that you do, that means it's an AMP page. An AMP page downloads literally within half a second. It's interesting, but so you have to do a complete mobile site on its own and then build a regular desktop website. Well, you can have you have a regular site, like say it's built with WordPress, mm-hmm. and you're using and you're using a res- a responsive design. Yes, a responsive design is something that it is. I call it. Most people will, will think of it as a smart website. It's a website that once it knows what browser and what device you're on, it reformats itself to fit that device. So that way, you can view the website um, at an optimal resolution and an optimal viewing in in the optimal viewing port um, with the AMP pages you you either download a plugin or you use a third party um, or you use a third party service and they build the pages that's interesting so, and then it's attached to then you have to redirect it and attach it to the website some people might do it just for I want to say a phone and they're not going to have the AMP pages show for, say, a tablet. But they'll have their responsive site shown for a tablet. Okay. That's interesting. I think nowadays with websites also, it's about user experience. And yes. building the site mobile first is what they yes. what we've been doing at CEA now for a while. And also, you know, user experience, but your, your experience on a mobile phone is going to be a lot different than what you have on a desktop. It's true. So it's you true. almost need to build two different sites just because of that. Because responsive doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get a great experience. It just means the website changes shape. It's easier to view, but it might not give you the same experience. Do you have anything to add to that? That's true. Well, I want to <laughs> say whoever is building your website at the time, you yes. need to make sure that as they're building it, even if it's responsive, that they're they're building it and they're looking at they're looking at it from all angles. It should be built. Um, the designer should view all options as they're building it. So they should be able to like use a WYSIWYG where they can go in and view it on mobile, then view it on tablet, view it on desktop, and also view it on a laptop. Usually you'll have four different views where you can view it as it's being built. Yep, and kind of take a look at it and what's that experience, what type yes. of things are more important to show up. True. With mobile, we don't put as much information on there because it needs to, because people kind of have ADD when they're on their phones and things like that. So you want to make sure you have the most relevant and interesting information at the top that people are going to interact with. And, and if, if you grab their attention, then you can, you know, put all the rest of the information underneath. That's true. And you want to make sure you have the what you want at the very top, which is called above the fold. Yes. So whether it's on a desktop or whether, no matter where it is. And I was explaining to people, too, that especially on a mobile, you need to have your calls to action right there, like a click to call button 
or a um, form or a um, or a, a share button. Whatever you want to use as your call to actions need to be readily visible yes. for people to, to take advantage of because that's how you convert from your website to a, to either a client or a customer, whatever you call your your audience. Yeah, you don't want your people having to search around for all those buttons and where do I go, what do I do? That's true, very true. I'm trying to get the conversion right away. And, <laughs> and, make, and also too, and make sure they're clickable. Because I, I've seen on a lot of websites that they'll have a phone number at the top, but it's not clickable. Right. So even though it's it's just in the HTML, it's it, you can just view it. That's it. Or in the address as well. Yes. Have yes. the address be clickable so you can click on the address and it takes you right to Google Maps. That's Which true. I see a lot of people don't. That makes that frustrates me yeah. when I'm on a website. <laughs> I'm like, I can't, I'm trying to get to it. I'm not sure driving not supposed to be doing this while I'm driving but <laughs> that's why I usually take the address and if, if I'm yeah. going somewhere I have it I put it in Google Maps before I even get in my car right. <laughs> <laughs> I try to pull over yeah. I try to pull those different maps but yeah no there's all those different things that we have to think about and it's one size doesn't fit all I think that a lot of a lot of companies really need to to think about that and Understand that you, you need to have a strategy for everything and make sure that, you know, have other people look at it to see are they having a good user experience and able to find all the most important information that they're looking for. That's true. And one thing that business owners never think about, they're thinking of building the website based upon what they want, not on what their user wants. Right. So <laughs> a lot of times when you go through the build process, you have to remind them of that. Yes. So it, it's kind of like I look at it the same way as if I'm building a website, like say I'm building a website for you, mm -hmm. but I don't particularly like the website, but I'm building it for you and your clientele. And if I think that it's not your clientele or that your clientele may not like this, I'll let you know. But the thing is, though, the, the main, um, the... The decision is up to you because you've hired me to do it. But um, but again, as you said, you and I are here to remind the client that yes, their that their audience that everything needs to be built and focused on their audience to bring people in, yeah, to convert them to paying clients and customers. I have to remind that about to clients quite a bit. It's yeah. not about you. It's about the people that are buying your products yes. and services. <laughs> That's where the focus yes. needs to be. Because <laughs> yeah, it's easy easy to get off focus. Um, SEO, what is uh, popular still today? Um, getting, I know, like off-site SEO, links and all the, you know, link building and all that kind of thing. How important is that today? Link building is just a part of it. You know, you mm -hmm. have to look at everything on a whole. Yeah. You've got... Speed is one factor. Mm -hmm. um, be, being mobile friendly is another factor. One of the big factors today is too is that Google considers something secure versus unsecure. So the easiest way to do that, they consider unsecure if it's just HTTP versus HTTPS. The way around that is just to get a um, a what's the word I'm looking for. Oh, sorry, is to get an SSL certificate. Yes. That will give you the HTTPS. Won't, won't Google just take take your site down if you don't have an SSL no. certificate? No. No? Okay. They'll just put, um, they will just put, the, uh, they don't use the word unsafe. They just use the word unsecure. Unsecure when you go on there. So what happens in that end is especially if, if you're on mobile and you're doing a search mm -hmm. and you click on an unsecure website, you're going to see this the first thing that's going to pop up is going to be um, a gray screen that says this site is unsecure. Yeah. So, and most people don't, don't want to do that. Well, they don't understand it either. They don't understand that the site is itself has not been compromised. They think that it's, that it might have, um, that it may have been corrupt or it may have been um, hacked, but it just means, I want to say 99.9% .9 of the times that there is no, there's, there is no SSL. 
Yes. I think what I've found in the last two years is a lot of websites have been getting hacked and to the point where Google won't even allow you to run AdWords because they find oh, mail, malware, is that what it's called? Malware. Malware, yes. yes. And how do you prevent that from happening? You need to have um, good security on the back of your website. Uh, since 30% of the sites out there are WordPress, a lot. my main thing that I tell people is hide your login, um, your login URL, which is your login address. It's wp-admin. It is your domain name slash wp.admin. I'm sorry, hyphen admin mm -hmm. is the... Um, is the default. And so a lot of bots go through that try and break into websites. Once they find that, they'll just try any combination of username and password. And also to um, limit the number of attempts that a person can use to put in their username and password. That's a good idea. And usually I say start with three, three attempts and then lock them out for half an hour. The next time that they try and go in after half an hour, um, lock them out for two hours, and then after that, lock them out for 24 to 48 hours. And then they'll just, they'll, they'll just kind of move on. Uh, another thing I tell people is when you, have a, um, when you have a WordPress login in the back, you want to make sure your login name is not readily shown. And that's when you go on, on the back end where it says display your nickname your nickname automatically defaults to your username. So you can you can change that to whatever you want. And I usually, if, if, if it's a company, I usually tell someone to put the company name, to actually put the company name down as what's going to display on the front end of the website for, for a blog when you have it as an author. Okay, interesting. And another thing you can do is um, make sure you have security plugins that can um, that can go through, that can crawl through your website and check it daily for malware. Yes, there are several out there, and several hosting companies offer those packages as well. Yes, we've been putting those on all of our client yes. websites. <laughs> <laughs> I think WordFence is a really yes. good one. Yes, WordFence and WP Security. Yes, are two very good ones, and so is it's called sc sc Scurry. SU, I think it's S-U-C-C-R-I, scary. That, that's another one. No, that's good. And then also the importance of website maintenance. I think what I see a lot of clients do or a lot of new clients that come in, again, a, a lot of them have this set it and forget it approach. Oh, yes. It's like, oh, okay, you built my website or... Um, I don't need you anymore. We're going to take this website in-house. And then when they take it in-house... They don't do anything with it, and then we're getting calls and saying, well, our website's down, and a lot of things happen when clients don't pay attention to their websites. I totally agree, <laughs> and that's and if they are going to take it in-house, mm -hmm. you should train them. Um, you should, I always tell people, you should be trained on the back end on how to do your updates and maintenance because it's just like, uh, I want to say, at least on the back end of WordPress, it's just like um, it's, things are constantly changing. So yes. things are constantly being updated. So a plugin needs to be updated. WordPress needs to be updated. Or this needs to be updated because there is new malware that's always constantly And they can out. get in through. They can get in through. A, they if can you don't get have in an update. Plugin. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Completely. And... So that's something that people actually need to do. Another thing that some people don't do, they don't do backups. So they really should do backups at least, you know, once a week, once a month, and should probably store them off-site. So that way, if the site does go down, they actually have a hard copy. Right. And it can be, it, it can be reinstalled. It might be six months old, but the fact is, though, is if you have one, you can, it can be, it can be uh, put back on the server and you can just update what is the information that's not in the backup versus starting over. Yeah, that's a good, that's good advice because I've seen that happen too. Where'd my website go? Yeah. 
we can't find it. So. <laughs> I think it's gone. We're going to have to start <laughs> over. <laughs> I told you you should have kept that um, oh, maintenance yeah. agreement going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they're trying to teach them things, too, sometimes. I mean, they're. I think cl- everybody gets really busy, and I always say it's best to stay in your lane of the things that you mm-hmm. know how to, you know, Work on your business and hire experts on all those other things. I totally agree. Because you're end up going to be spending a lot more money later on if you stop doing it, try to bring in house, and then let it all go, and then you're going to spend a lot of money fixing everything. I totally <laughs> agree. I mean, I've seen some websites that have not been updated on the back end for three to four years. Oh, my gosh. And some <laughs> of those, you you let the person know that as you're doing the update, it could crash because it's been so long since it's been updated that you you take it and you update certain sections and then you back it up. So you might do seven or eight backups while you're going through the update process in the back end. And some of them may not even have a template or a theme that can be that can be updated anymore. Or they or you have to jump through hoops and go through the different updates for the different versions. Wow. I've seen that happen. Yeah, that's that's a lot. Pretty much need to build a new website after that. <laughs> yes, pretty much. Because I mean, it could because yeah. in a situation like that, if it's been a couple years, I mean, it could take four or five hours to do updates on the back end, just to be cautious and not have the entire website go down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's what you don't want happening. Yes. At CEA Marketing, we take your business, your passion, and your why, and we sell it. If you're unsure where to start marketing your company, CEA Marketing is here to help. Our team at CEA has tons of experience and top-notch training, which helps you take all the stress and confusion out of marketing your own business. After years of working with large companies like Pulte Homes, the Outback Bowl, and Metro Places, we guarantee the successful implementation of a marketing strategy. Talk to me about blogs. I This is another thing that I see. A lot of companies have blogs on their website. And what's the difference between a good blog and a blog that you put on their website that doesn't really benefit you at all? You're having a blog just to have a blog. <laughs> It depends upon what you're blogging about. Mm. I mean, you know, Google loves content. And so, and that's one thing about SEO as well, too. The more content you have on your website, I want to say content that is geared towards SEO or geared towards your audience, the more Google's going to like it and the more Google's going to pick it up and the more you can rank for certain key terms. When you write a blog, um, there's two ways to approach it. You can write it just for informational purposes for your clients to read if it's something you think that they're going to be interested in. And how Google likes that or how Google sees that is that it's specific that you are adding content to your website. Or you can write blogs that are written more for SEO. So it's written more of in a structure term and it's written for a particular key phrase or a particular key phrase in a city. And it still has to be written so it's interesting to all of, to your audience, but since it can be SEO'd and it's written in, and it's written um, with SEO in mind, then it's ten, then you can tend to, it's picked up, usually picked up by the search engines. Right. Oh, that's, that's good advice. And, and another thing, which I know you're starting, you're starting to get into with your company yes. is, is doing video blogs. Mm-hmm. So I love video blogs. And, <laughs> and the great thing about video blogs, mm-hmm. which I'm telling people, and, and you can, um, what you can do is you can separate, you can still have written blogs, but you can have video blogs, whereas you can put them on YouTube, but you get it transcribed. Yes. And so the transcription is actually the content portion for the website. So that way, it's it's a combination between an SEO and a, and just a regular informational blog. But when you do the video blog with a, with a certain clients, the video blog is can be based upon a keyword or or a topic or one particular keyword within the topic. Yes. So what you want to do is you want to make sure you have. Um, you have a file that you can upload for subtitles and that you have 
a file or you actually have the transcript so that way you can use so that way you can use the transcript and people can view the transcript or they can see or you're I want to say you're ADA compliant by having subtitles as well right those are all great tips and a lot of times I know for me I would much rather do a video than write a blog um, so some people some people like to write some people like to do the videos video I think tells a story a little bit better than the written blog. Well, what people don't realize, too, is that you can sit down and do a video blog and do several of them at one time. Mm-hmm. For example, like you can come here to Second Soul. Yes. And you can <laughs> spend a couple hours here. The people can, you can already have the list of questions that you want and then just film everything and you guys edit it and you might have, you could do, whether you're doing one blog a month, whether you're doing two, whether you're doing three, you you can have them edited and you can have them pieced out. Yeah. So depending upon your budget, you can mm-hmm. have them pieced three at a time, four at a time, five at a time, and so you can have them. And it, you know, I know each each particular each particular industry and each particular um, business has their own budget, but I know you work within their budget or you work with something. Yeah. So we, it works for them. We do. I think it's a it just. Because especially for some things that might be a little bit more complicated, explaining, mm-hmm. having video that where you can do that really helps. We are working with a virtual reality school um, right now as one of our clients. And we brought them in to kind of explain the, the different pillars of um, education and, and how everything works for them, how the technology works. And we were able to bring them back um, cause a lot of people were asking a lot of questions yes. on social when we, when we first started doing the aware, but that was the idea and the awareness yeah. is yeah. like, get people thinking, okay, what is this? And so from there, we were able to take all the questions that people were asking mm-hmm. and did a whole FAQ kind of thing. And also their, their main pillars of what they're selling really explain them in more detail, because something more than what a 30 second or 60 second teaser spot can't do. True. Um, we went in and we created, I think we created like 20 videos for each topic and for each question that was asked and then had that video, put it up on YouTube, um, added all the tags and everything in there and also took those videos Mm -hmm. and put them out on social media. So people were seeing like, oh, wow, there's a video on this question that I just asked. So we had everything there and we were able to produce it all. Um, in a couple hours. Well, see, again, in a situation like that, even if somebody does video FAQs, Mm -hmm. FAQs are a big component of SEO. And people don't realize that, that you really should have an FAQ page because there's something called schema data, okay? And FAQ, you can optimize a website for schema data and have you ever have you ever noticed when you do a google search you'll search for something but you see those drop down boxes that yes. has like a question mm-hmm. that's the schema data that's the faqs so if your site is optimized for that i want to say you cuz but you will need it you will need a text trans, a text transcription of that so if you have an faq you can have a video and you can have a little drop down that also has all of that has all of the text so all of those questions, all of those answers and questions are pulled from websites. Yes. So that's the first thing that it's called the zero position on Google as well. If you're answering people's questions as they type it in, that's the first thing that will show up. Yes. And most people don't realize that mm-hmm. there's a whole different ball game. There's a whole different thing on the back end. Mm-hmm. So I'm always like, give me those FAQs. I said, they may, you may not think it's an FAQ. But anything in your industry, and it's one thing that you, and you can consistently add to it. It's not like you need a lot on the FAQ page at first. Yeah, you can even start with two questions, and then you just keep. You can you can keep adding. That's the beauty about SEO is you, mm-hmm. you're constantly adding. It's not it's not just a one and done. It's not nothing is ever final. Things can always be changed. That's what I love about the digital space. It's not like if something is in print, it's hardcore. Only way to change it is to redo it. That's right. Whereas, you know, digital, especially like a website or anything like that, it's like you can you can change a word in five seconds and upload it. You absolutely can. And that zero position is gold because mm-hmm. if you're able to answer someone's question, that's the first thing that they're going to click on. Yes. Say, it's, okay, 
click and it takes you right to the website or right to the blog or right to that FAQ section that answered your question where the person can go in and learn more. Yes. Now you're starting to build trust because you're being yes. educational and helpful. And that might be a company that I want to do business with. That's true. And it the that those questions, those answers will come up before the ads do. Right? Don't they come before the ads or mm -hmm. after the ads? No, they come the after, first the thing ads. after the they ads. Are, That's right. They are the first thing. Usually what pulls first up. First thing in organic. Is, it's a first thing in organic. Yes, that's right. That's you'll, right have, you'll have ads first. And you'll then, have two or three ads. Then you'll have um, then you'll have the top three in um, Google My Business slash Google Maps. Right. Um, if it is like location-based or something like that, if it's relevant to what your search is. Then you'll have the questions, and then you have the web. Then you have the organic, organic websites. Organic website, right? So things. So the organic website keeps getting pushed down and down More. and down. Right. Now you brought up something. Another question I have for you. Sure. And this this is a big question that I get from my clients as well. Is so the the question and answer thing that's awesome, but I feel like one of the other things that's really super important is Google Maps. Yes. And how do you how is how do you get like to become that first company that pops up on the map? What's the to get in the three pack? It yes. is there's a lot going on it's with a that secret sauce. Um, <laughs> Google uh, Google Maps and Google My Places are basically one in the same, right? Even though they're different, even though one pulls back in a search and then Google Maps pulls back actually on maps, it's the same content. Um, Google does love Google, but how Google Maps does, it's, it's, it's different when it's searched. It's searched by the location address of the business to the proximity to where the person is searching from. So, for example, if for, I want to say this is like 90% of the time. If I'm how close searching, you are. How, it, it is how close you are give to you the, the top proximity. Three. They okay. will give you the They will give yep. you the top three. One of them may be a little further away. Like say I'm, um, I am doing marketing agencies. If your if your Google My Business page is optimized to the way it should be, then if I'm within say a couple mile radius, you should pull up. But it's not going to pull up a company in St. Petersburg. Versus you, it tends to the mo mostly pull up locally where you are, and it's where you're searching from. So if I'm searching for marketing agencies in Clearwater, mm -hmm. it's usually going to pull back the marketing agencies in Clearwater that are closer to Tampa. But a lot of factors go into that. A lot is one is is how old it is, how consistent you are posting, how much information you put on it. You know, you want to, you want to check all your boxes. You want to use in, you want to put your description in there. You mm -hmm. also want to make sure that you use all 750 characters. You want to put um, all of your, um, your areas in there. For example, mm -hmm. if you're a personal injury attorney, I would not use lawyer first. I would use personal injury attorney first and then use lawyer. You want to use a more specific for what you are. So and that has more to tendency to do with like I want to say the medical field or the yes. law field, because you don't because you want people to find you for what you're actually doing, and try and go for you know anything that relates to you, but how you rank them is how Google sees them. So you need to put your most prominent one first, and um, another thing you need to do is you need to post on there. Because again, Google loves Google. You need to treat it like a social media platform. Yep. There is an area that's on there. Put um, videos, put photos. Videos, photos, maybe geotag the photos. Um, go to go to the area and it's, it says what's new. You have 1,500 characters that you can use. Unfortunately, you only have one line to put everything in. So I always recommend that if you're like putting a blog post in there or whatever you're putting in there, put it in Word or put it whatever you're using as your editor first, copy and paste it in there, and then view it. Always have an image in there as well. And always use their drop down, which is part of the posting for saying like call now or visit my website or view. Always link it back to your website or something. So that way, um, 
so that way you'll know it. Turn on every feature that you can. They have a new feature, um, which is a call history. I love the call history feature. Where, so that way, it'll give you your calls for the last 45 days, and it tells you whether it's been answered or whether it hasn't been answered. It gives you the number, and it gives you the time that the person has called. You know, that just went off beta. And um, it will even send you an email saying, we see you haven't returned a few cold phone calls yes. lately. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, well, what's going on? <laughs> That's really cool. But then I can get on my team like, hey, why aren't we following yep. up with people? Like, we had some missed phone calls yeah, some here. Yes, missed phone calls. <laughs> and awesome. Always respond to reviews. Yes. You know, there's just so much. Put your products in there. Put your services in there. You know, and under your services, make sure you're adding descriptions. Use, use key terms that people will find you because that's going to help you show up more in Google. That's how, that's really how you optimize it is putting everything in. I've even started putting hashtags in for some people because hashtags can be searched or start, you know, that's starting to become relevant now where, where your people are searching hashtags, even on, um, even on search engines. I mean, it's yeah. not, it's, it's not that big, yeah. but what can hurt if you have the extra room, Yeah, you know, to add a hashtag that's just, if you have the extra room. I wouldn't put it in the in in the text. I'd put it at the bottom. So, yeah. so in photos is a huge, huge thing. Yeah, they'll actually tell you how many of your photos were viewed and your top yes. photos, so you can see what kind of content people are really yes. looking at on your Google My Business page, and even videos. But they'll just show, tell you what kind of videos people watch. And one thing that I love about Google now is they're going back to their old. I want to call it insights. They're, they're calling it the new format, it, but it's actually going back to the old format because when I'm talking old format, it's showing you, it's going to show you what key terms you sh- uh, people have searched and you actually popped up. Yeah, that's, I love that. They didn't have it for almost about a year. They had gotten rid of that. They had quote unquote their new format that they have right now, but, but they're going back to that and adding to it. So it's really not that new. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like saying new Coke. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, what we did over here did work, so maybe we need to go yeah. back over here. <laughs> uh, Google My Business is a gem. That's why I tell all my clients that if you're going to focus on anything, and especially when you're first getting started, yes, you might take a while to build a website and get all that mm-hmm. going, but you can you can do business right from your Google My Business page. Yes. You can start getting phone calls immediately if you have that optimized. And this studio that we're sitting in right now, we told completely optimize the Google My Business and we get more business off of our Google My Business pages than anything else. I mean, it's the first thing people see. Yeah. And even if some even if someone doesn't have a website, one of the options on there is you can build your own website is for them. Well, Google builds like a little website for you mm-hmm. off of your information that's on the Google, my business page. Yeah. But if you have an actual website, I would tell people do not use that because they're going to use that versus sending the people to yeah, your website. They will. It's good to do temporarily Yes. yes. while you're waiting. Yes. And it's actually not that bad. I do. We always recommend building a nice website. Yes. Um, but the Google feature is pretty cool. Um, it is. It's great. Yeah, and sometimes people will go to your Google My Business page and they might not even go to your website. So you want to make sure you have all that relevant information because I can see what pictures are on there, the videos, Mm -hmm. and the other thing, the more content that you put on your Google My Business page and also even your videos on your YouTube channel, you can actually take over the entire Google page with everything, with all your information. You You can. can own, own, I, I tell my clients, own, own your page. page. You know, I always tell <laughs> yeah. people there's, there's, well, now there's four, but there, but yeah. the main three pillars to taking over a Google page or ranking on Google is your Google ads. Okay. Cause you can have one listing there. Yes. Your Google, my business. Mm-hmm. That's another one. And then your organic. Okay. So those, there's those areas. Um, the, again, the FAQ thing's kind of a hit or miss on whether yours will show up, but if, it, but once you start optimizing that and get it, it'll show up. But, but those three things. So if you're going to do a full circle of SEO, meaning everything you want it, you want to go for everything. That's what you want to do because that way you're, as you said, you're going to, you're going to be on top and you're going to, and you're going to own the page and you can even rank organically 
for more than one page with the same key term. Yeah. So I've got, I've had people that have ranked three and four times. This is over a number of years of doing SEO. and We've got several pages that are optimized and we continue to add on that you'll have three or four pages that will rank on the first page for the same key term or a variation of the term. But, you know, the, as I said, the Google My Business is great and you want to dominate. You want to dominate in that. And as I said, Google loves Google. Content, content, content. Yeah, they do. So, and especially the more you use it and the more and the more you post on their little on their little post area and link back to your website, you know, it's it's a it's a formula. It's a, it's a crawling, it's 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 AI, so it's so it's a crawling machine that goes that that goes through it. It's not a person that's actually thinking and analyzing and putting it towards it. Yeah. You're right about linking to your website because they, they like they, they like they like to see those external links. They like to see, but they mm-hmm. they like to see the external links, but they like to see external links too from other other websites. Yes. And one one thing that people have asked me before, well, should I buy links? I'm like, no, no, you never buy links because the big thing years ago, and you were asking me about a change, is link farms. Yeah. Link farms used to be where you it was just like websites or pages where they, you would do reciprocal links back and forth. And Google put a huge penalty on that, probably about maybe, I want to say, I'm thinking that may have been 10 years ago. Yeah, I was so glad when they did that yeah, because that was so annoying when companies did that. And in a lot of times, see, I'm sorry, go ahead. I don't see how it really worked for them because the websites were ugly and just full of links and not really good yeah. information. And a lot of your <laughs> links will come organically. Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole thing, and especially – Directories are a big yeah. are a big issue as well too. Non relevant information. Yeah, well, I think they look for relevance and they look for relevance, mm-hmm. and a lot of the directories are relevant um, in industry specific directories as well too. Yeah, those are really good for links. But yeah, a lot of companies will reach out and say, "Hey, we can give yes. you so many links. Don't do it." <laughs> um, and then you also have your aggregators. Aggregators are a big thing. You want to try and get linked. You want to try and get listed in the aggregators. An aggregator is, I want to say it's like a, it's a major directory, which is going to have your NAP information, which is your 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 main information um, for your company. It'll have your name, your address, your phone number, and your website. And a lot of other places pull from that. And so you can be listed on a lot of other directories or a little ones you haven't heard of because they're pulling the information from that. Think of an aggregator as like a credit bureau. You know, when you the three major credit bureaus, they have mm-hmm. your credit rating and other companies that you're getting a loan through or whatever you're doing will pull your credit information from that credit bureau. That's almost like what an aggregator is. It, it, it can take six months to get actually listed on an aggregator. Wow, that's great advice. That's a really good one. The other thing that you had talked about, you mentioned three. Let's talk a little bit about Google AdWords now. What's my benefit for Google uh, AdWords? The main, the main benefit <laughs> of Google AdWords is you get listed within an hour. Right. Um, because, and but it's one of those things that you're paying per click. You're not necessarily you're not paying per impression. You're paying per click. So um, you create the ads based upon your audience and your needs and the type of ads that you want to create because there are several different types of ads and it's specific to each industry and each client. Um, And you bid on the key terms or you add the key terms that you want the ad to go to. And there are two different, I want to say there's almost like there's three different types of ads. You've got um, the newest one is... uh, is Google local service that is but that one's more difficult for people to get in because it's only specific industries and they also have to do a background check and they've got to verify license but that is if you can get in that that's top of the field I mean that's that's at the top and you're actually paying per lead and that can be more beneficial for certain for certain industries and then you've also got um You've got Google Ads Express, which used to be called AdWords Express. Mm-hmm. That is a um, that is a smaller version of the ad, but that's easier for people that want to create their own ads. It's easier for them to do that. The easiest way to access that is through is through your Google My Business page. Over on the left hand side on your dashboard, it'll say 
It'll say create ads. Mm -hmm. So people can create their own ads off of that. And it's simple and it's not that complicated. And then you've got the full blown Google ads, which can encompass everything under the sun, which can encompass retargeting. I mean, you can have all different types of um, call outs, other links to other pages on your website. You know, that's regular Google ads is more where you need to bring a professional in. Yeah. And then um, what, what are some mistakes that you see companies make when it comes to Google ads? Google ads, um, the number one mistake that I see is the, um, is probably the area that they're trying to cover for their budget. So you may have somebody that's starting with $1,000 but wants to cover five states. I'm like, no. I said, you have to start small and you have to build out because you may only start with and you may only start with one or two zip codes that where your current clientele is coming from or most of it you may not have to expand because that's where everybody's coming from because if you start in a huge geographic location your ad's not going to show up as much because you have a lot more competition because you have a lot more competition mm-hmm. and you're in a much broader spaced out area Whereas if you're consistent and start in a smaller area, then if that doesn't work, you move out. And Google Ads is not like create it and and leave it. You need to, I want to say, optimize it yeah. and let it and babysit it for like a minimum of two to three weeks. And you need to tweak it. Like the areas you need to tweak, uh, the keywords you're using. You need to add keywords that somebody may, um, a perfect example is what you gave me earlier with meatloaf. Yes. You know, um, whereas meatloaf the entertainer or meatloaf the recipe. Right. You, if somebody, if you're at, if, if your website is about meatloaf recipes, you want to make sure that meatloaf the entertainer is put on as a negative keyword. Yes. So a lot of that, it's, it's trial and error and, it, and it's consistency. And you really don't know how much your ads are going to cost you per click until you're actually in there and it's done. You can estimate, but, you, but you're, you're not going to know the campaign until you're there. And it can change daily. Yeah. Because you've got, other, you've got other competition. And if you don't know what you're doing, it can eat up your ad budget really fast. Oh, very <laughs> fast. Very fast. Yeah. That's why I see a lot of companies do is not knowing what they're doing, not understanding it enough. Probably best to reach out to a professional and help them get you set up or yes. do some training, get get certified or something so you mm-hmm. have some knowledge. Otherwise, you're going to waste a ton of money. Well, and another thing is, too, is they're trying to do too many. Um, they get too broad and try and do too many services or too many products at one time. Yeah. So if you, again, it's it's kind of like the area type situation. You almost need an ad campaign for each product that you're you do and start mm-hmm. and start it maybe start with two or three versus 10 because if you start with two or three one of those may not work so you go on to, so you go on to the next product you have to you you have to test it mm-hmm. and it is and you almost you have to know what's working I mean very few people can get in there and get it done the first time and have everything work smoothly yeah it takes a while you need a strategy, a plan, and you need to constantly be analyzing that data. Yes, yes, and you need you to can't go just run it, ignore it, and let it run. <laughs> and then once it once it's optimized and it's pretty much running itself, you still need to go in and do maintenance on it because again, things are constantly changing. So you need you need to look at your ads. You need you might need to uh, change up the wording a little bit. You might need to add specific key terms. You may see a term a new term that needs to be put on the negative campaign list. You mean you, you may need to change your budget. You know I'm ta- when I'm talking budget I'm talking budget for that specific ad or that specific key phrase. You may realize that most of your that most of your traffic is coming in say between eight and five. So you only run that ad between eight and five. Or if you want to run the ad the entire time, you increase, you increase your um, your 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 spend or your your cost per click for that particular ad, maybe 25 percent for for that time because that's your busy time. And the only way to know that is to actually run the campaigns yes. and to look at the data. 
<laughs> I think a lot of people yeah. are like, whoa, that's a lot. <laughs> you don't think that we do a lot when we say we have a digital management fee, yes. people, but we do a lot for that management fee. You just heard her. <laughs> It's a lot of work. <laughs> That's what experts at my, like yes. myself look at every day. <laughs> right. That's my next big thing is I, you know, t- talking to small businesses and even I do a lot of consulting um, for medium-sized businesses that have um, in-house marketing departments. Um, and I try to tell them that it's so important that, Whoever you're hiring, you know, whether it's your marketing company or if it's someone that's internal that's doing it, or even if you just hired an internal marketing director that's managing your digital marketing company, you really got to do your homework and yes. check these people out. Yes, as you do. And even, or if it's an individual freelancer that you're bringing on, okay, well, I'm going to save money and I'm going to use a freelancer. It's great, but be very careful because nowadays everybody's an expert. Everybody knows everything about social media and everybody knows that they think that they can just take a course online and, you know, now all of a sudden they're an expert and, you know, they're not. And that it's troubling when I hear this. You really got to ask them lots of questions, ask them to see case studies, look at their current work that they're doing Call their clients and check with them. Hey, did they do a good job for you? Um, and then people, when they're when you're hiring people, um, also just make sure they have all the qualifications that they say they have. Because a lot of people, they're, they're, you're listening to Lori. There's a lot that goes into all of this. A lot of training that you have to do, school, um, and it's constant. It's it doesn't ever ever stop. It's it's. Yeah. Constantly learning. I mean, one thing is mm-hmm. like my husband is, I want to say my husband's kind of my marketing director. He kind of keeps me in line a lot of times. But what he does a lot too is he finds for me the information that I need to know and that I need to learn. So if there's like uh, anything mm-hmm. new with SEO that he's like, look, you need, you, you, need, you need to read this. So that way I'm not constantly trying to find the newest information Right. I mean, yes, I do, because it comes across my feed and everything else, and I hear about things, but he's always telling me, you need to look at this, you need to look at that, because as, as you said, things are constantly changing, so it's it's a field that's ever-growing, mm-hmm. and I mean, when I first started in this, I mean, there was no such thing as social media, Yeah. so I think what we had, Squarespace, not, no, not Square, um, MySpace, MySpace, yes. MySpace, and then YouTube started, YouTube was really the first one that was that was the big hit. Besides and it keeps, keeps going and going and going. I know, and more I know. And it's, it is huge. And again, and people have to look at their audiences. They have to make sure too, like with their social media platforms, you don't need, the company doesn't need to be on everything. Who is your audience? What are they on? If it's, you know, it could be a combination of two. It yeah. might be a combination of three. It may only be one, except... Google is for everybody. Yes. That I have to say. The I Google agree with My you. Business is for everybody. That's number one. Mm-hmm. And then you go to your other platforms as well. Yeah, but you don't have to do everything. No. Sometimes no, that's never. too much. That that's too much. Because, you know, Twitter is for a certain has a certain type of audience where people are on Twitter all the time. The same with Instagram, the same with LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok. Yep. YouTube. All very different yes. audiences. All very different audiences. So having a laying out who your target audience is first and then also establishing goals. What are you trying to accomplish before that? And then figuring out what are the best uh, channels where we should be. And then Correct. from there creating a budget based on that. Based on that. That is the thing because mm-hmm. – Search engine optimization slash Google ads coincide with social. You really need both. Yes. We were talking about that earlier. You and I were talking about that earlier. Whereas SEO, Google ads feeds, uh, feeds an immediate need because the person is actively searching mm-hmm. for that service or for that product. Social is to build rapport with the audience, to build the brand, 
get the name in front of somebody. They're not looking for the need at this time, but you're putting the name and your product or your service in the back of their head. So if they are looking for it or if they are asked for a referral, you're the first one that's going to pop up. So that's going to be for a future need. Yeah. Or it could be that they're doing their research and they're, they're scouting you out. They're, they're, that's true. Yeah. That's true. That's kind of like, you know, um, there are a lot of employers, mm-hmm. they look at the social feeds of people. Yeah. Especially things that are longer. I mean, I think a lot of times your product-based services are a lot like that. Like they have a, they have a, a need right now where they're just yeah. going to go on and search and look for mm-hmm. it. Or they might not have the need, but that, that's where the awareness comes in of yes. putting the things out there um, on, on social media. There's the other side of it, just with me working a lot in real estate, um, also tourism, travel, those kind of things. I think people will... People take their time to do their research. They do. Um, we find that, I think a long time ago, the stat was 80%. Now I think it's almost like up to like 100% really of people that will start their search online before they will even reach out. And a lot of people will have their three choices down and then they're going to go in and then they're going to fill out a form on your website. But they're not going to do that until they've checked you out, they've they, they've gone on your website. They looked through everything on there. Now they're going to check for social proof, mm-hmm. go through Correct. what are your reviews, and then they're going to look at your social feed and try to learn, especially for real estate, I'm going to move into a community. I want to understand what the culture of the community is, or maybe it's a new, just learning more about what it's going to feel like to live there, because you're not going to get all that information from a website. That's very true. I mean, it's yeah. as, as we were discussing earlier, it's a whole package. Mm-hmm. You need everything to work together. Yeah. What works for one person in a situation is not going to work for another person in a situation. Somebody may just do social and that's it. Or mm-hmm. somebody may just do, go to the website and then they're, they're, they're fine with that. And then you've got people that want the whole package, yeah. like, like we were discussing. So you have to do, you have to do the entire audience. It's just like there are some people... Like on like for search engine optimization, there are some people that will not click on ads, but there are some people that will only click on ads. Yeah. So you've got a you've got a wide variety. Mm-hmm. You do. So it's big. I mean, you know, and you can in in even if your company has got some negative reviews, you know, you need to just continue on because not everybody's going to have a hundred percent positive reviews. Right. So usually you don't. Yeah. Usually most people don't, and then. You know, sometimes if if you see somebody with a thousand reviews and they're all five star, you know that there's that yeah. there's there's a problem there. There's something there's yeah. something going on there. Yeah, because <laughs> in, in some instances, some people is not are not going to be happy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You know, honestly, I think a lot of times I like to see unhappy customers, especially on a big purchase like maybe it's a car or a home, for example. That's yeah. one of the biggest purchases of your life. And, you know, a lot, a lot happens during that whole process, especially it takes, it could take like eight months to a year to build a home and not everything's going to be perfect during that whole process. There's always things that go wrong and people always use social media as an outlet. I think what a lot of people look for is, well, how do they handle a problem? That's true. And that's why I would say always respond to reviews if it's positive or if it's negative, always respond but respond in a professional manner yep. and do not get too personal on the responses. You just tell the person to contact you and that you will try and correct the issue if it is if it is an issue or whatever or whatever it is. Never blast somebody because of what they have written, even though that may not actually be what occurred. Um, that looks bad very unprofessional and bad Mm -hmm. on you that is bad for your brand yeah just be honest and then and walk them through and try to make that solution always try to get them off of that conversation to where you can take it offline with the phone call and then once you solve the problem for them you can always ask them to go back on and change their review and if you do that most people appreciate you know if you solve their problem they'll, they'll go back and do that oh yeah and people can also tell when there's just some I'm sorry, an ass I, on there, yes. you know, that yeah. Yeah. You, you, you can tell, kind of, like, okay, that sense. guy's not, yeah, they're trying, and he just wants to be a, 
a bad guy, yeah, you know, yeah. and sabotage this company. And, and that's not, and people can read through all that. Yes. So I always find reviews interesting <laughs> reading them because you can always see when that's happening. Yes. You know, like, okay, there's the You can conflict. always see that, yes. How yes. is this going to get resolved? And, and you can tell right away, like, there's no way they're going to resolve that problem, you know. And, and there, are se- <laughs> there, there, are, there are several, um, I want to say there are several categories right now where you always have a negative review, some things regarding, especially around COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's as far as I'll get into that. But that's why also, too, that during the initial phases of COVID, Google pulled, would not let it have any new reviews for, I think it was like close to six to eight months. They wouldn't post anything. That's good. So that was the reason there were no new reviews coming out during the initial stages of COVID. Yeah. So I felt bad for these restaurants. There wasn't much they could do no, about, you yeah. know, bad service. <laughs> you know, it can kill a company too yes. by having all that on there and would take a really long time to recover. Yes, it can. So. Well, it looks like we covered like a ton of topics, <laughs> so knowledgeable and all these different things. And, you know, Lori does a lot of this uh, with, with my company. And I think it's just really great to educate yourself. I know a lot of clients are curious about it. They they might be afraid to spend money on it. And I, I'm, I get all that. But it's so important to, like we mentioned a couple of different things, like some key points is hiring an expert, finding the right expert to help you, at least in the beginning stages until you can get an understanding of everything. Make sure that they're giving you that training along with it so you can truly understand what they're doing for you. Because if you don't understand what they're doing for you, then you're probably going to think it's not working for some reason. I've seen that before. If they don't understand something, they think it's not working. That's true. Um, oh, always have the person explain it to mm-hmm. you because you're the one that's paying for it. So you're <laughs> the one, you should know exactly what they're doing. It should be, there should be transparency. Yes. You should have a really nice long discovery process between you and the agency that you hire or the freelancer to make sure that they walk you through the steps is this is how I work. And once the plan is together, this is what I'm going to do for you. And these are all the reasons why always make sure you have goals that you're giving somebody like this is what I'm trying to accomplish. And if you do a lot of those things, I think you'll, you'll be successful. Um, and you just ask a lot of questions. Anything else? I think you hit all the core topics yeah. and all the core features on hiring someone. Yep. It's really important. I would really start there. If you want to do it yourself, like we mentioned earlier, just make sure you give yourself a ton of training and really understand what you're doing. Otherwise you're going to waste a lot of money. That's true. So be careful with that. And we're here for you. So reach out. Um, you can always email me directly, kelly at com. Thank you for joining Learning Curves today. Lori, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for we all learned me. a lot. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Second Soul Studios is a full service production studio with capabilities for photo, video, podcasting, editing, co working, and more. Our photo video studio has a number of different backdrop choices and props to choose from. We also have a gourmet kitchen set. Or, if you're an upstar podcaster, you'll love our four-person podcast studio. So what are you waiting for? Visit SecondSoulStudios.com to book a tour today.